2019 has been a year of global political unrest, protest, and struggle. As we prepare for the new year, I've come to speak with Reverend Jackie Lewis at Middle Collegiate Church in New York about the practice of what she calls revolutionary love. Can love really sustain our movements for social, economic, and environmental justice? And when we're at our wit's end, can love renew us so that we may return to our work to repair the world? That's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Well. I'm here with Dr. Reverend Jackie Lewis at Middle Collegiate Church in the East Village of New York City. Thank you for spending some time with us, Jackie. I'm so glad to have you here. Isn't the sanctuary the most beautiful, peaceful thing? This has been the most calm I have felt in months. It is um, such a beautiful space. This is the third sanctuary for the Middle Collegiate Church. We are the oldest continuous Protestant church in North America. You precede Six, the federal government, we if I remember. 1628. And this building was built in 1892, and it is just peace, 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 everything. Yeah. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about. Yeah, let's actually. talk about it. Um, last time we connected, it was about a year after the 2016 election. And I remember you had spent the summer getting arrested. Yeah. <laughs> We'd spent the co summer covering protests. We were wondering how on earth do you think about the year that has just gone by? I'm going to ask you that same question. Uh, yeah. How do you characterize the last year, the last two years since we last connected and talked? Yeah, I would say that these uh, hot mess times, <laughs> I'm going to go right there. This is the hottest mess time, and it's not the, it's not the first time, right? You, you and I both know it's not the first time. But I think there's something really excruciating about this time right now for me, I would say, as an African-American person uh, and woman who went from the euphoric, amazing election of Barack Hussein Obama, mm -hmm. not a perfect president, but my president, and all the ways that that felt like a promise of what America could be, um, that this dream, Laura, this, this dream set up by our founders, not ever quite really fulfilled, a dream deferred for sure. Um, neither you or I were a gleam in the Constitution's eye. But here's Barack, and we did it together, and young people did it together, and old folks did it together, and this kind of sense that we were making progress, mm -hmm. making a way out of no way. And then the reaction to that is the unleashing of the latent bigotry and white supremacist ideologies and the election of a wholly unqualified, mm -hmm. didn't even think he was gonna get elected himself, is my suspicion, right. um, whose behavior, demeanor, um, lack of empathy, just <laughs> rips off some kind of bandage or um, lid, pick a metaphor, and all of a sudden all this mm -hmm. ugly is revealed to us again. So this year, this year as we build up towards election of 2020, mm -hmm. how do you think this period is settling? Like, yeah. which, is it a glass half full kind of a moment? A lot of protest all around the world? Or is it a glass half empty, not enough protest? Everyone in my congregation would say, gee, these last two years we've really swung our pendulum toward out. We really have. More in the streets, Kavanaugh, environment. We've been to the border several times, rebuilding Puerto Rico. Like we really had an extroverted energy to sort of go fix things. Mm -hmm. But inside, all of the things, like it isn't just that Puerto Rico's broken. It's that the people who are Puerto Rican and who are Latinx or Hispanic cannot believe that Puerto Rico doesn't get rebuilt. They can't believe the infrastructure, can't believe people are in cages. So you've got this political, socio-political um, events uh, causing deep pathos and pain. The way I think about it is that the world is on fire and, and then the, the people who are the most vulnerable, the ones who have the least psychic resources, the ones who have the least financial resources, mm -hmm. not the ones who have money to go to therapy, or not the ones who have money to go to yoga and get massages once a week, they are totally traumatized by what's happening in the world. 
God comes to the margins, my friends. God comes to the powerless, to the poor, to the disenfranchised. <laughs> Neither that brown Palestinian Jewish baby in the crib nor the man he grew up to be demanded allegiance and Christian armies to destroy the world in the name of love. Who is that little white shiny baby on the Christmas cards? <laughs> I don't mean any harm white people, but really. <laughs> Have you been to Israel? <laughs> there might be one blonde baby in the whole state. I don't know. What happened? <laughs> Greed, the commerce, commodification of a beautiful story because we can't bear to imagine that the powerful ones aren't the ones in the center of the narrative. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. You straddle that ground of healing the soul and healing the world, mm -hmm. as you put it. This is a soul-destroying moment to be yep. living. How do we do. be people in this? <laughs> I, I just think that that is the question. I really do, Laura. I'm working on a book, and good God, please book come out of my body. Please come out. But um, trying to think about what are the things we need to do as humans? 10 things, not 10 commandments, but 10 principles um, so that we can survive and thrive together. And at the root of this is this concept of Ubuntu. Um, I, I, just, I just have been so fascinated for years about the truth and reconciliation movement in South Africa, and particularly the leadership of Mandela and, um, and Bishop Tutu, but also womanists mm -hmm. all around the nation. I just was at the American Academy of Religion and got hooked up again with my black sisters who, who are inspired by Alice Walker to mm -hmm. think about womanism. Mm -hmm. And this idea that we are, I'm gonna say, in the womanist frame, it would be we're grounded in love. Mm -hmm. We're grounded in love as a public ethic. Um, we're grounded in stories as a way to think about um, resilience and hope and getting through it, getting through it. Um, and this Ubuntu thing is simply, I am, because you are, like we are inextricably linked together. And I'm thinking that the way we're gonna get through this and the way I'm watching people get through this is um, to remember that we're linked to each other. Like our liberation is linked up together. And, and what that means is both you protest together and you walk with your fists up in the air together, you organize together. A bunch of middle people went to Virginia to do some organizing around voting rights, but also you play together. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got to play together. Mm -hmm. You've got to take time for what we would in my community call black joy. But joy, you know, you know the pride march on is, is, is evidence of joy that is queer joy, right? You go to a Latinx party and, um, or march and you know that there is, um, this Hispanic joy, there is joy in every culture, mm -hmm. Laura, that is what happens when you're at the dinner table talking trash, or in my community, you're playing cards and somebody's talking a lot of smack and slamming the cards down and having a cold beer. The truth is, Laura, if more people would find themselves in mixed company, no kidding, mm -hmm. and find a way to tell the truth. I'm not saying white people ask black people to teach you about race, I'm not saying that. I am saying be a student yourself. Yeah. The 1619 Project has so many resources on the website and podcasts for people to sit in caucuses sometimes, just white folks by themselves going, girl, honey, let me tell you, this mm -hmm. is what has happened. But also I think we have to find a way to build bridges together you know that's the secret of middle church. Um, mm -hmm. But this idea that we, what we have in common is we all know it ain't right. Mm -hmm. And we all do believe a little bit at a time we can fix it. Um, you know, the civil rights movement or the Southern freedom movement in the 60s had this like big kingpin leader, no pun intended, but Dr. King right as a locus of, of power and all of that. And movements aren't like that right now. Um, we see more diffuse leadership. We saw that with Black Lives Matter. We saw that with Occupy Wall Street, right? Which is smart, which, so which you is, can't just take off your leaders. Can't just pick one off. The opportunity for that, the frustration in that is someone can say, like, how do you measure the progress? But the opportunity in that is all of the surge groups that are white folks sitting around dealing with race all around the country, right? Bend the Ark. Um, I love those guys. A Jewish Partnership for Justice have like moral minions Laura, like 10 people makes a minion. Mm. So you can have 10 good Jewish people fighting for justice and they make a minion and they're all over the country. Um, the Revolutionary Love Project has pockets all over the country. Um, those of us who are working on this Revolutionary Love Conference. Which we're gonna talk about more in a minute. Pockets all over the country. So what, do I, what, am I, what do I say as a recipe? We have to be honest about the failures. White people have to own their racism and their white supremacy. 
black people have to own um, fear and apathy. Everybody got something to come clean about, <laughs> and we got to come clean about it and find ways, to, I think, to make what my friend Brian Brunt would call pockets of resistance. Mm. One day when the glory comes, it will be ours. It will be ours one day when the war is won. We will be sure. We will be sure, and I can hear God's people say, "Glory." Glory. I came to work for the God I fell in love with when I was eight-ish years old. Um, I was taking the communion or the Eucharist, some people call it, but it's basically a Jewish Seder that happens in the Christian church, bread and cup, you know, God is present. And um, I was sitting next to my mother and the little bread came by, a little cube of bread, I took it. She said, Jackie, this means God will always love you. And when the cup came by, she said, this means God will never leave you. So it's a mother sermon whispered in your ear, God will always love you, God will never leave you. Certainly all of my life, degrees and certificates and books, that is the simplest uh, articulation of my faith. Mm -hmm. And I think I feel called to help as many people feel that presence of the presence as I can. So I'm, I'm selling God. <laughs> and the political piece? I has to be because Polis is about the people. And these people who act like faith and politics don't go together, I think how, are you, I, it's laughable. The, the product of faith is a healed and whole world. And that means we have to do all the things. Mm -hmm. say, the right, say the good things, sing the right things, practice good behavior with each other, but also heal this planet mm -hmm. and heal this world. The church of your family, your parents was a Southern black church mm -hmm. your family moved north yes they brought that tradition yeah that was a church that was deeply involved in revolutionary and civil rights activism That's right. how does this moment compare to that vis-a-vis -vis the role of churches and mm -hmm. i i have heard some of my colleagues in black churches fully black churches say i'm missing some rigor some teeth mm -hmm. I'm not in a fully black church, I'm in a multi-ethnic church, so I, I can't really say that. I see in this place and in other churches like this, a real um, nostalgia for, commitment to, and I would say study of, mm -hmm. Southern Freedom Movement. I have to imagine that that's true in black churches and Latino churches and white churches, that there are churches that are pockets of resistance and that they are taking their cues from work that's been done in the past, mm -hmm. studying Ruby Sales, thinking about Martin Luther King. Um, and I, I could make a list of 50 churches off the top of my head who are doing it. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think anybody who doesn't see it happening ought to make it happen. All right, if I'm going to cop to white supremacy, <laughs> okay. you have to cop also to some of the crimes of the church committed in the name. Uh, oh yeah, of I'll, I'll cop church. to it. I'll cop to it, and it is my church. I'll cop to it. I'm a Christian, so I can talk about the church with authority. Hell yeah, the church wrote apartheid. You're not kidding. The church wrote apartheid in South Africa. The church and and South Africa got its. Um, model for apartheid from America. Mm -hmm. The church, the church took the Exodus story out of the Bible and gave it to enslaved Africans and said, you know, here's your Bible. Mm -hmm. The church focused on uh, slaves obey your master. So the church has confession to do and reparations to make. I'll, I'll go that far. 
And the church also did the Southern Freedom Movement. Mm -hmm. The church also did emancipation. The church also did women's rights. So we have to redeem what's good about it, those of us who are Christians. And I think we have to own that we are, have a long way to go. And is that happening? Do, well, yeah, in lots of beautiful places. Now, let me talk about the bad first. There are these folks in Texas, I'm just gonna say, who have the audacity to preach that Jesus isn't for justice. In other words, the God who is sovereign designed poverty and designed ecological destruction. And our job is to just watch it play out. We shall because have God, We just say, right, hello. Men but, over women, <laughs> men over the earth, okay. white people over right. black people. Yeah, exactly. And one of those pastors had their publishing rights uh, um, rescinded from a, from a good churchy publishing book. We know that that's wrong. We know that that's wrong. And what I'm excited about, again, as a Christian who believes there's more than one path to God, I am much more interested in the coalitions I make yeah. with everyone. I think with as much candor and truth telling as we can muster, I'm going to make a recipe called truth telling plus joy plus resilience, meaning stick to it We are We are seeing changes. We, I mean, I think about how many people get in the streets from Hong Kong to you know, Honolulu. I mean, mm -hmm. people are in the streets, disgusted, despairing, determined to make a difference, to make America, um, I was working with an acronym today, magic. <laughs> make America just, inclusive, and compassionate. Magic. We need some I magic. think people want magic, and I think um, we have to keep pushing our electeds. We have to keep um, using all the tools at our, our fingertips, our protests, our petitions, share good news, listen to somebody else's point of view so you can make a cogent argument, um, laugh, pray with our feet, defy the bigotry yeah. by making multiracial, multi-everything communities of justice and love, teach our children tolerance and acceptance by playing together and letting them see us do that. I just, again, if we can't fix it, then I think we should all go move to Paris and drink a lot of wine and eat cheese. <laughs> but since that's not the option, I've got a grandbaby now who's 18 months old. Her name is Ophelia. And I'm committed to, by any means necessary, mm -hmm. Um, put truth in the world, put love in the world, put passion in the world, put kindness in the world, and expect the world mm. to come back with that. One of the ways you're putting all of this into action is with your 14th annual conference. You're calling it the Revolutionary Love Conference this time around. What is it? And what role does revolutionary love and the event itself play in your, your year? This is one of the most important things I do about public theology. It's called Revolutionary Love Toward a More Perfect Union. Um, we have had 13 here in New York, but we are taking this one to D.C., uh, April 24th to 26th, 2020. And what will happen there? We're going down there to be at All Souls Church Universalist. We are doing a Friday, Saturday, Sunday speakers, organizers, um, panels, plenaries, workshops, networking, and a rally in Malcolm X Park on Saturday, hoping that 2,500 people will come to an ethical spectacle with music and dance and organizing tables around. Why go to D.C. right yeah. now? Because this is the most important election, I think, of our lifetimes. And we want to make sure that we put um, the ethic of love right in the center of D.C. Pay attention to what's happening down there. Um, weave into the issues, into the conference, and be able to be nimble and responsive. And what's the goal of the conference? The goal is to inspire an intelligent electorate to fix America. How about that? That's ambitious, right? The promise of the preamble, right? We will have this more perfect union. Well, it's not perfect. And in fact, the founders never had me or you in their mind. They didn't have indigenous people in their mind, African people in their mind, women, um, poor people in their mind, non-Christian people in their mind. But I believe that there are enough of us across faith and age and ethnicity and um, social location who have a vision for a nation that can work for all of us. So we're going to gather, share good stories, tools, tactics, strategies, and movement build, voting rights, prison reform, gun control, um, poverty, social um, social networks, um, social safety networks. We are going to make America magic. 
make America just, inclusive, and compassionate. And does the work stop at the end of April? Absolutely not. We're going to start in January with organizing. We're going to go through the event in April, and we're going to organize together all the way through November to make sure that we register young people to vote, to make sure that we stand up for uh, human rights, that we work about um, the Supreme Court, that we pay attention to how we can use our collective power to demand a just nation. Stepped in the water, the water's cold. Angels in heaven don't sign my name. It chilled my body, but not my soul. happy to be in a coalition with Simran Deet and Valerie Kaur, and I'm happy to be in it with Linda Sarsour and Tracy Blackman, and I'm happy to be with Simone Campbell, who's a Catholic. It doesn't matter to me whether you name God or how you name God. It actually matters to me how we name love and what we do about it. That's some of the people who will be at the Revolutionary Love Conference. That's who will be at conference. the conference. When the love is the public ethic, love, love is the secular and faith-based ethic that is binding us together toward healing our nation. What can people do if they want to get involved in, oh. in either the conference itself or the revol revolutionary love movement? Excellent. Um, RevolutionaryLoveConference.com is the easiest place to go, but we're actually beginning a 10-month campaign that starts in January and goes through November, so the conference is in the middle of the campaign. Mm -hmm. There'll be curriculum, there'll be live tweets, there'll be um, uh, Zoom sessions with some of the nation's key leaders. There'll be things to do in your own neighborhood. It's a beautiful day in your neighborhood. Things to do in your own neighborhood so that our movement building is both come together to hear thought leaders and organize, but also all the way through election time. Here's the um, issues that we need to focus on. Here are the people who are doing good work in your local place so that our po politic is local and national. Final word for people who are maybe watching this during the holiday season feeling a little bit alone um, or despairing. One action for people to take. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm gonna give three. One is when you're going home for the holidays, courageously be a truth teller at your own table. Know what you know. We don't have to be rude and stank to our families, but when people start theying, you know, why are they still whining about racism? We didn't enslave them. Why are they still whining? They can get married now, you know what I mean? Yeah, why I are right. they, yeah. When, when someone is doing the, that, that kind of talk, if each of us would, would gently care front people and just help them to think about it differently, and, and one could say. Did you say care front? Care front, mm -hmm. care front. Put the care first. Care, care front, yeah. Because if you have a moment of like a, a tantrum, you, no one's listening. Mm -hmm. But a good question is, can you say more about that? Mm -hmm. Because that's not my experience. Mm -hmm. or, or let me tell you about Laura. You know, let me tell you about Jackie. One of those ladies. Right? Just like really personalized, gentle love. Don't let lies of white supremacy sit in your dining room table with the turkey. That's, that's one thing. I think secondly, I would say at middlechurch.org, there are lots of things to watch and see that are joyful and, I mean, good music, um, well thought out talks. I'm just saying, watch some, consume some love, mm -hmm. is what I'm trying mm -hmm. to get at. Consume some love. And that might mean go see a movie that makes you happy. That might mean curl up with a good book, and, but consume some love. There's so much violence and you know vitriol right in the media on tv and in our world just consume some love mm -hmm. for, for a minute would, would be the second thing i would say and the third thing i would say is really to try to turn a little um, kindness onto yourself uh, back to the way that the world makes us personally traumatized like just take a walk you know drink some water <laughs> have a cup of tea take a hot bath Look in the mirror and say, this product is a beautiful human being and has gifts and love to give the world. <laughs> and really my last question, yeah. 
Is it just super easy to be a black woman leader of a church these days? No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it's not super easy at all. In fact, I probably have not, I probably have experienced more overt racism as a clergy than I did when I was a girl working in the corporate world. But it is also the very best thing I've ever done. And I am undaunted by uh, chauvinism, uh, male domination, and racism. Jackie, it is always fantastic being with you. Thank you so much for having us here at Middle Collegiate. Dr. Reverend Jackie Lewis, everybody. You can find our past conversations at lauraflanders.org and uh, check us out on the web. You can find Middle Collegiate also online every Sunday and pretty much all the rest of the time. Uh, Middlechurch.org. Yeah. She just said it. Middlechurch.org. We'll be at the Revolutionary Love Conference. I hope you join us.